Hi there, and thanks again for joining me here at Preaching the Gospel That Saves. This station is dedicated to the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel that saves us today, Paul's My Gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. This station is also dedicated to the King James Authorized Version, the blood-bought text, the majority text, the English text that has no mistakes, the perfectly preserved Word of God, the King James Authorized Version, straight out of Antioch. This station will never use the Roman Catholic, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Westcott and Hort, Nessel, corrupt translation. Never ever will. Why anybody does use those translations, I, it, it's just ignorance is all it is because I was there myself. 2 Timothy 2.15 in your King James Bible says, and you will not see this in the new translations. When I came to know dispensational truth, this was one of the verses that I was dumbfounded was changed so much in the other translations. In 2 Timothy 2.15 it says, Study the show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, if you're using an NASB, hopefully not an updated NASB because they changed it again, if you're using a new international version or a new living translation or even the ESV, which has been a pretty popular uh, translation, I don't even call it a Bible, I call it a translation because it's not a Bible. The word study is either changed to be diligent or do your best. The word rightly divide is changed to correctly handle or accurately handle, which are both wrong. Um, the better words are, of course, out of our English text, the King James Bible, study. Study is a lot different than doing your best, and rightly dividing is a lot different than correctly handling. God tells you exactly how to handle your Bible. And that's by rightly dividing. How do you rightly divide? Well, you rightly divide by knowing who the Lord is talking to as far as Israel goes and the Jews, which are the same, okay, in prophecy. Or is God talking to the new creature, the church, the body of Christ, which is mystery. You need to divide those. You need to rightly divide those. You cannot mix those. If you mix those, you will be just like 80 to 90 percent of Christianity where you think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is New Testament. Okay? It's just, it's just ignorance is all it is because if you study to show yourself approved unto God, first of all, figuring out which Bible is the right Bible. Okay? Second of all, figuring out who God is talking to in the Bible. And third, understanding that we function today according to our Apostle Paul. Because when you understand Jesus' earthly ministry in the prophetic kingdom, the prophetic place, okay, the prophetic program, Jesus was never talking to us. The church, the body of Christ, is nowhere to be found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? So anyway, as we continue to go forward, this station is dedicated to the gospel of the grace of God, which you find in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And as we've as I have revealed to you, the churches and the websites that we have visited do not tell you what the gospel of the grace of God is. They tell you the gospel of the kingdom. They tell you you have to persevere to the end. They tell you you have to confess your, with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord. They tell you to make Jesus the Lord of your life. 
They tell you to, to let Jesus in your heart. They tell you to follow Jesus, which no one is following Jesus today, okay? First of all, Jesus said to sell all your possessions in Matthew chapter 19, and he said to keep all the commandments, okay? No one's doing that. No one can do that, okay? There may have been some people that sold all their possessions, but to keep all the commandments, that's another story, okay? No one's following Jesus Christ today. We are to follow the ministry that Jesus Christ gave to our Apostle Paul. He is the one that got the gospel, the grace of God, okay, not Peter. And that's the gospel we preach on this station today. And that's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So there it is. In verse 1 it says, I declare unto you the gospel. Verse 2 it says, by which also ye are saved. Verse 3 is, is that how Christ died for our sins? And verse 4 is that he was buried and rose again on the third day. Okay, there's nothing about confessing your sin in that gospel. There is nothing about repenting and being baptized in that gospel. There is nothing about persevering until the end in that gospel. There is nothing about accepting Jesus in your heart or making Jesus the Lord of your life. Those things are not the gospel. Those things, if you trust in any of those things, that's a sure way, sure ticket to get yourself into hell because the only thing you need to trust in is the death that Jesus Christ died for your sin, the burial, and the resurrection, okay? We know that it's without works. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Okay, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 confirms that again, that it was a gift of God, that none of us should boast. Well, there's no boasting. Whether we boast or not, God says there's no boasting. For by the grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And it is not according to the works of the law. Okay. Galatians 2.16 confirms that, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So hopefully you're not doing works of the law because that's not going to justify anything. Okay, You cannot please the Lord in your flesh or by doing anything of the law, okay? The Bible is very clear when it comes to that. Now, we're going into part seven, and this one's gonna be very lengthy, so I'm gonna give you a fair warning because there's a lot of material to cover. Hopefully you will stick around on this station. Hopefully you will learn to be a Bible believer. You will learn that there's, a, there's two programs going on in your Bible. One is prophecy, one is mystery based on Galatians chapter 2, verses 7, 8, and 9. That verse also confirms that the, book of, that the books of James, Peter, and John are written to the circumcision, not the church, the body of Christ. Okay, so that's another thing that you have to get in your thick skull. It took me three years to comprehend that, okay? If, you're a, if you've been under covenant teaching, if you've been under prophetic teaching, and you never heard much about the church, the body of Christ, never heard much about Pauline doctrine, it's going to be difficult for you to reprogram your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Okay, But you can do it. You need to study to show yourself approved unto God, and you will be able to be fully per persuaded in your own mind. Romans 14, verse 5. Okay, You need to be fully persuaded in your own mind because you're the only one who's going to be standing before the Lord, okay? And that's Romans 14, 12. Okay, you will give an account of yourself.
okay? So you need to make sure that what I'm teaching you is right. Hopefully you're following along. Hopefully you got a King James Bible. Hopefully you are taking your King James Bible and comparing to what I'm saying with your other Bibles that you use. Don't throw them out. They're great tools to just show you how wrong they are and how right the King James is, okay? It's a great tool to have the other Bibles and to see all the errors that are in them. And again, I should say other translations, not Bibles. So, this is Mega Church Salvation, Church Agenda, Tithing. This is Part 7. And the reason why the Church, the Body of Christ, does not tithe, and the reason why this is probably going to be one of the most lengthiest teaching on this station, on this station preaching the gospel that saves, there are no more temple sacrifices, okay? Since Christ paid our sin debt, there is no need to pay tithe someone else to do this service for us. Okay? So if you go to 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21, we know that Christ paid for our sin. I just shared with you the gospel. That's what he did for us today. We know we believe that by faith, not by sight. Faith is believing in what you don't see. We never saw that Christ died for our sin. We never saw that he was buried, and we never saw that he rose again. But we believe that by what? By faith. When we believe that by faith, what happens? It's counted as righteousness, okay? We know in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I mean 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21, this is exactly what happens to us when we believe the gospel of the grace of God, okay? So if you come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 16 through 21, it says, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. We don't know Christ after the flesh, okay? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. That's Israel, that's the prophetic program, based on the authority of Romans chapter 11. Okay, Israel is fallen, Israel has been cast away. Israel is diminished. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's the mystery. That's the church, the body of Christ. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Jesus Christ paid our sin for paid the sin for all of mankind two thousand years ago. Confirmation of that is no one's doing animal sacrifices today. If they are, you know, they end up in jail. The animal sacrificial system is done. Okay, when Christ died on that cross. He took that part away. That part, he became that one sacrifice once and for all, for all of mankind. Okay? And it says here that he's not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now turn to Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, verses 4, 5, and 6. You get more on how he is not imputing sin against us. Romans 4, now to him that worketh is, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if you're still doing that work, again, we talked about this. Romans chapter 11 confirms this. Galatians chapter 2 confirms this that we cannot mix law and grace. It's either one or the other. And here Paul says it even again. To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if you're still working, it's not grace. It's debt, it's law, it's works. Okay, we're in grace. Romans chapter 6, 14. We're under grace, not works. Okay, when the Bible says that, it's true. Okay. 
Remember, the law and the covenants were only given to Israel based on Exodus 19.5. Scripture tells us this. And Hebrews chapter 8 was the New Testament was given to Israel and the Old Testament was given to Israel. So Hebrews chapter 8 confirms that about the New Testament given to Israel. Jeremiah 31 confirms that. And Ezekiel 36 confirms that. And it says to here, But to him that worketh not, that's us, the church, the body of Christ, but believeth on him that justified the ungodly, his faith, what did I tell you? Okay, if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sin, your faith is counted for righteousness. And he is not imputing sin against you. He paid for all your sin. Every stinking bit of sin that you will ever do, ever done, ever think about, ever, until the day you go and meet the Lord in the air, okay, has been paid for. And then he goes back to David and he says, Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Okay? If you have faith in what Jesus Christ did for you, that he died for your sin, was buried and rose again, then your faith is counted as righteousness without works, and he is not imputing sin against you anymore. Done, okay? Done. He is not imputing sin. He reconciled the whole world to himself. He is not imputing sin against anyone today. Now, if you don't believe that, well, then you're an enemy of Christ. And... Absolutely, all that sin that he's not imputing against you, look out when you die. But all that sin, when we believe, when we have faith in what Jesus Christ did for us, all that sin, he's not imputing against us. Okay, so get that. Get that. Because then you got to ask yourself, why do I keep working and trying to keep the law when he tells me it's without works and it's just by faith and that's counted for righteousness. Okay, if you turn to and that's why we don't tithe today. Romans chapter 3 verse 24 says Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that were passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what? Law. Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Okay? We know that we're not under the law, we're under grace. We know we're not Israel. We know that the tithing was only given to Israel under the law, under the covenants. And we know that Christ paid for our debt. We do not have to pay a tithe. Christ paid for it all. Okay. Now, Christ paid our debt. There's no need to pay the tithe to someone else to do the service for us, right? Christ is the mediator be, be, between God and man, not a priest. Okay, Not a priest in this the dispensation of the grace of God. So what does that mean? If the Bible says in God's perfectly preserved word that Christ paid our debt, then why do we keep paying? We know that the law and the covenants were only given to Israel. We went, we went through that. We know we're strangers to the law and the covenants, right? We didn't touch that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Okay. Back in time past, when the Law and Covenants were given to Israel, 
we were strangers. Okay? We were strangers. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Okay? Many Christians tithe because they don't fully understand what Christ did on the cross. Hopefully you understand what Christ did on the cross. And hopefully you understand what you have to believe so that your faith will be counted as righteousness. So that you will not have so that you will understand that every single sin he's not imputing against you. Okay? Instead of trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ, many people are told to come forward and make a commitment or sign a card. Hey, I was in a church service once where we had to write all of our sins on a card and then bring them up front and then people would pray over them. I don't know if your church has ever done that. But what, is that, what does that say about what Jesus Christ did on the cross? That's just law works. That's just not trusting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Others are told to pray through and let go. Another is told to hang on. Others are told to open your heart's door and let Jesus into your heart. But this is not the gospel either. Hearts don't have doors, and no verse in any Bible says that Jesus wants your heart. If you could show me in a Bible translation, any one of them, even the wrong ones, okay, that Jesus wants your heart, email me at buttonnowministry at gmail.com, okay? Now we're going to touch base a little bit on Greg Laurie. He's a, a celebrity Christian out in California. He's the pastor of Harvest Crusade, and he's pretty famous for going around the country and filling large baseball stadiums, any kind of stadiums, claiming they are preaching the gospel, okay? Now, Greg Laurie is a big endorser of the New Living Translation, which removes the name of Jesus Christ more than 70 times. He's a big endorser of the New Living Translation, the New Testament, which the New Testament alone removes 30, about 30,000 words compared to the King James Bible. 30,000 words. And again, you will not see 2 Timothy 2.15 the way I've told you about rightly dividing. You won't see that in that Bible. You will look at Galatians chapter 2, verses 7, 8, and 9 in that Bible, and it claims that Peter's gospel is the same as Paul's, which is wrong. Peter has the gospel of the circumcision, and Paul has the gospel of the uncircumcision. Two different gospels for two different dispensations. Okay? One is prophecy, and one is mystery. Okay? I know that's a tough one to get to. You know, there's different dispensations that are going on in your Bible. There's different programs that are going on in your Bible. And you have to understand that God is moving through your Bible. He doesn't just stop and teach the same thing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that he does in Romans. Or, or you don't take what was said in Romans and put it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That is wrong. That is textual error, okay? That is using your Bible in unrighteousness, okay? You cannot take Noah's Ark and put it in Paul's writings, but yet everyone takes Paul's writings and puts it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They know the difference between Noah's Ark and today, but they don't know that there's a difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Paul's writings. I don't get that. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they sacrificed animals. They were under the law. There was a priesthood. That was all done away with when Christ died on the cross. Colossians chapter 2 confirms that, that the law and the ordinances were nailed to the cross. The middle wall of partition was knocked down, ripped in half. You know, done away with. No more Jew or Gentile today. Done. Israel's cast away, gone, Romans chapter 11. But yet, these churches, including Greg Laurie, teach you that you're Israel. You're a sheep. You have to be a disciple. That's wrong. We're the church of the body of Christ. We're ambassadors. We're new creatures. We're not even born again. We're new. Born again is Israel's program, okay? Israel is who gets born again. Israel is God's firstborn son back in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. 
okay? Israel gets born again, not the church, the body of Christ. All right, so as we go through Greg Laurie, and I'm going to quote, you can go online and pull up one of Greg Laurie's sermons. He's got a lot of sermons online. And he, you could pull up his preaching, and this is from one of his crusades that you can listen to online. And I quote, this is what he says. He goes, here is the gospel in a nutshell. We have all sinned. We all fall, we all fall short of God's standards. There is nothing we can do to meet the righteous requirements of God. But God loved us so much. 2,000 years ago, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, to die on the cross for our sin. Then he rose again from the dead. Now if people turn from our sin and put our faith in Christ, we will be forgiven. We will go to heaven when we die, and by the meaning and the purpose you were looking for, that's the gospel truth. Now you've heard it, so you're responsible. Now respond. Again, this is not the gospel. The gospel truth is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And let me read it again for you. And you tell me, I just read what Greg Laurie said. You tell me if it sounds the same. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. This is the gospel of the grace of God. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, that how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Let's see, he says that Greg Laurie said that he died on the cross for our sin, but he doesn't mention the burial. And then he says, then he rose again from the sin. Now if people turn from our sin, he's telling you to turn from your sin. That's a work. That's not in the gospel, the grace of God. That is not in the gospel. That I, There's nothing about turning and there's nothing about responding. At the end, Greg Laurie says, now you've heard it. So you're responsible, now respond. Again, that's a work. He's putting you back under the law. He's telling you to do works. Okay? That is not the gospel. Remember? It's either law or it's grace. It's one or the other. Remember in Galatians chapter 2, it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Romans chapter 11 says, it's one, it's either works or not. It's either grace or not. Okay? And faith it's our faith that counts us for righteousness. And faith is believing in what we don't see. It's not turning. If you, if you turn, then you're not trusting in what Christ did for you. You're not having faith. That's not faith. That's a work. You're trusting yourself. You're turning. And then you're responding. You're trusting yourself again, not Christ. Okay, this is the self-made gospel that's going to take you to hell. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. All right, if it's not of yourselves, why is he telling you to turn from your sin? It's not of yourselves. Why is he telling you to respond? It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Why does he want you to turn from your sin? Why does he want you to respond? Because, just like most of these preachers, just like the preacher I was under, he wants to boast in how many people he saved. He wants to boast in how many people got baptized. He wants to boast in, in some of these churches how many churches are getting planted. That's boasting, and that's wrong. Not according to me, according to God. According to Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. Okay? Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Okay? Righteous works. Water baptism, tithing, repenting, turning from your sin, responding, confessing your sin, going up front to pray a prayer, signing cars, 
jotting down your sin, throwing your sin in a, in a casket. I went to one service where we wrote down all our sin on a card, and we went to a mock funeral where there was a casket, and everybody put their cards in a casket. Again, not the gospel. Not having faith in the death, burial, and resurrection is what that causes. It causes people to do works. It causes people to trust in man and not have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Greg Laurie, as does many pastors, and the last one, Galatians 2.16, before I continue. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, right? And Galatians, since we're here, 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. All of these people that put you under the law, they spit on the cross of Christ, okay? Christ died in vain, according to these people. Greg Laurius does many pastors who do not believe their Bible as their final authority. He's a New, Li New Living Translation believer. They do not rightly divide. You can't find it in that, in that translation. They are not Pauline. He puts you under Israel's doctrine. He tells you you're a sheep, and he's your shepherd, and you need to be a disciple. They miss the gospel. He misses it. He's mixing law and grace, and that nullifies the gospel. You can't mix both. God makes that clear. There's more than three verses that make that clear. Lori's presentation of the gospel is, I don't know, it's way too long. It's not simple. The gospel's simple, okay? It's simple with no law added. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 says what? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God, upon the children of disobedience. Colossians 2.8. What does it say? Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Okay? That's that vain deceit. Okay? He, he's teaching you law works. He's telling you you have to do more than what Jesus already did for you. Jesus did everything for your soul salvation. Every single thing. Okay? Jesus did it all for you. You are complete in Christ. You cannot add anything else to what Jesus Christ did. If you do, you nullify what he did. You void him out. That's what Galatians chapter 2 says. Okay, he died in vain then. All right, that should free you up from the law. You don't want Christ, the work of Christ, Jesus Christ on the cross to be in vain, do you? I hope you trust what he did by faith. Romans 8.29 says, I mean, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 1.29 says, No flesh should glory in his presence. Okay? 1 Corinthians 1.17 says, and this is coming from our Apostle Paul, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Okay? There comes a point where the Apostle Paul does not baptize anymore, and that's the dispensation of the grace of God we're in now. Okay, He did baptize a couple people in the early part of his ministry, but it stopped. What is everybody doing still? I don't know. And then it says, Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. That's what Greg Laurie, as do most of these preachers. They use wisdom of words. And what does it say in 1 Corinthians 17? If you use wisdom of words, the cross of Christ 
will be made none effect. And that's what they do. They tell you you have to turn from your sin. They tell you you have to repent. They tell you to confess your sin. They tell you to come up front. They tell you, hey, Greg Laurie even says, and I've been to one of Greg Laurie's ones in Chicago. Come down front. Meet with somebody. They'll give you some books. Start with the book of John. That's the perfect book for the Christian. That's the worst book to give a Christian when he comes to know the Lord. That is the worst book. That's, that's a book all about Israel. It's Old Testament doctrine. It's Israel's doctrine. If you're, gonna, if you're a newly saved Christian, start in the book of Romans. Okay? So if Laurie tells us to turn from our sin and he tells us to respond, this is works which makes, which makes the cross vain. This spits on what Jesus Christ did for us. 1 Corinthians 15.2, which is part of the gospel, Paul even warns us in the gospel, it says, Keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Don't believe in all this other stuff. Believe the gospel. The gospel is how you're saved, that Christ died for your sin, was buried, and rose again. 2 Corinthians 6 1 says, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, you guys, is the day of salvation. This is the dispensation of the grace of God. This is not the prophetic program. This is the only time where you can have faith in the death, burial, and resurrection and be saved without works. It's today. It's now. And this, the dispensation of the grace of God, is going to end. And we don't know when it's going to end. But it's going to end. And I hope that you're trusting in the gospel that saves us today. Not the kingdom. Not the gospel of the kingdom. Not the gospel of the circumcision. But the gospel of the uncircumcision. The gospel of the grace of God. The gospel that saves you today. As we continue through our study... There are two famous preachers who may or may not have you may have not have heard of or not know. One is Vance Havner, who was an evangelist for over 70 years and held meetings in thousands of churches in every state and in, in several countries. Another is B.R. Lakin, who was called the Prince of Preachers, and he was Jerry Falwell's mentor. You might know Jerry Falwell. He preaches a lot about Revelation, and he's on YouTube, and he's on... But anyway, his, his pulpit ministry was world, world, worldwide for five decades. Presidents, prime ministers, kings and sheiks were among millions who heard Lakin. Two great men with over 100 years of preaching experience between them testified to a pastor personally that between 66 and 75% of church members were really not converted and not going to heaven. Okay, Three quarters of America's church membership will never see heaven but would instead burn in hell. And one, you know, cliche that I've heard, and I, and I know it's very true, and it's this. More people will go to hell from a church pew than a bar stool. The hardest people to share the gospel, the grace of God with, the stuff that I am sharing with you today, the hardest people to share this truth with are churched people, churchgoers, because they don't hear this. They hear that you have to repent. They hear that you have to turn from your sin. They hear that you have to go up and pray a prayer. They hear that you have to accept Jesus in your heart or that you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life. It's not the go That's not the gospel, you guys. I'm telling you what the gospel is. Okay? That's not even in the gospel of the kingdom. Repent and be baptized is, but praying a prayer isn't. Making Jesus the Lord of your life isn't. 
And again, no one is following Jesus today. Okay? If you were following Jesus, if Jesus was here today, you know what he would say? If you asked him, what do I need to do to follow you, Lord? You know what he would say? Follow my apostle Paul. I gave him the ministry for today. It's no wonder why with works, 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 added to the gospel, remember, there's no additives, fillers, or preservatives to the gospel. Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, Second Corinthians 5.19 says, To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Do you understand that? Do you understand that Jesus Christ took the sin of all of mankind? He paid for everyone's sin. Now for, for that to count for you as righteousness... You have to believe that by faith. And then you're saved and your faith is counted as righteousness. That he died for your sin. And then all your sin will not be imputed against you. Do you get that? Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And verse 3.11 says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Do we trust in Christ and Christ alone? Galatians 2.16 Romans 5, 1 and 2 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans 9.30 What shall we say then that the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? Our faith in what Jesus Christ did, the death, burial, and resurrection, is counted as righteousness. And you have to hear what the gospel is, right? Because, you know, if you're Calvinistic, you know, you think everybody's predestined, so you don't even need a Savior because you're already going to heaven. So, And why share the gospel with anybody? Because they're probably already predestined to go to hell. Well, that's wrong, okay? It says, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Okay, you have to tell people this, you guys. That's our job. Okay, don't believe the Calvinistic God because you're just going to end up in hell or you're just going to be this servant of Jesus Christ that does nothing, that doesn't get anybody saved, and you're just doing this law works at your church, serving in the children's ministry. That's wrong. Get out there, share the gospel, the grace of God with somebody, be an ambassador of reconciliation. That's who you are today. You're a new creature. You're not Israel, you're not a sheep, and you're not serving in the children's ministry, okay? Get out there, preach the gospel, the grace of God, get some souls saved. They need to hear it from you, okay? Jesus Christ isn't walking around today. You represent him today. He's up there seated in heavenly places next to God the Father, okay? And he's not coming back who knows when, but that's where he is. He's seated right now. All right, he's sitting. He has us to do the work now. And that's the work of reconciliation.
all right? We believe this by faith. Our faith is counted as righteousness. We don't have to turn from our sin, turn and burn, and all that other garbage, okay? We need to believe the gospel, the grace of God, okay? What is faith? Well, the definition of faith is in a Hebrews epistle. We go to a Hebrews epistle for definition. It's not our doctrine, okay? The book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews, all right? Not the church, the body of Christ. All right, I don't know how much, I don't know, how much more I need to explain it when it says Hebrews, okay? It's the epistle of the Hebrews. We go there for definition. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us the definition of faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, okay? If you're turning from your sin, if you're responding, are those things not seen? If you're going up front to pray a prayer, if you're telling everybody Jesus is the Lord of your life, is that not seen? That's not faith, guys. Also, Paul confirms 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul confirms what faith is. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And 2 Corinthians 4, 18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We are to live for eternity today, and that's what is not seen, right? You can even go to another verse if you want to get confirmation on that. Unless, you know, you're Israel and you're, you're building a kingdom. Well, you know what? If you're Israel and building a kingdom, good luck, okay? Because the Bible says we're the church, the body of Christ. And it says... In chapter 3, it says of Colossians, verse 1 and 2, If ye then be risen with Christ, because guess what? If you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, then that means you're risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above. Wait a minute. It doesn't say seek those things which are of the earth. It says seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Where's Christ? You said you're following Jesus Christ, right? Well, he's sitting right now at the right hand of God. How are you following Jesus Christ? I, I don't understand that. But verse 2 says, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. All right? And then we can go back to 2 Corinthians, like I just showed you. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, and we'll just finish off with that. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, and that would be the things of the earth. Those things right now are temporary, guys. Why are you building a kingdom that's temporary? They're temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So you keep building that temporal kingdom right now, where guess what? Jesus Christ isn't even the king of it. He's crucified, remember? Then he died, then he was buried, and rose again. So you're building a kingdom for no king right now because guess what? He died and was buried and rose again. Then he became the head of the body of Christ. He's doing something different today. Hopefully you'll understand that on this station. All right, it's no works, Galatians 6.14. What does works do to the cross? Well, it nullifies the cross. It voids the cross out, okay? The last thing I want to touch on is a track, a tract that you're probably familiar with. It's called the Four Spiritual Laws. I want to read it, and let's see if the gospel is here without works, by faith alone, Christ alone. Let me read it, okay? Now, you got to remember as we read this, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John before Christ died are Old Testament, so... It goes like this. Have you heard of the four spiritual laws? Law one. Just as there are physical laws that govern the physical universe, so are there spiritual laws that govern our relationship with God. God loves you and offers you a wonderful plan for your life. God's love. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And by the way, all these verses come from the New International Version, which this station knows, and hopefully you know, that's not a Bible. Okay, So he uses 
a verse from John. That's an Old Testament verse. God's plan, Christ speaking. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly, that it might be full and meaningful. Again, this is John chapter 10. That is, again, Israel's doctrine, not the church, the body of Christ. Why is it that most people are not experiencing the abundant life? Well, probably because he's giving you the wrong verses out of context. But anyway, because, he says, law 2, man is sinful and separate from God. Therefore, he cannot know and experience God's love and plan for his life. So now he's going to take a verse and he's going to put it back here with John. Okay, now he's going to Romans. Man is sinful. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Man was created to have fellowship with God. And then he adds all this stuff. This is all added. But because of his own stubborn self-will, he chose to go his own independent way and fellowship with God was broken. This self-will, characterized by an attitude of active rebellion or passive indifference, is an evidence of what the Bible calls sin. Now, why he just simply didn't go to the Bible and look up sin and give you verses on sin, I don't know. But he says this, man is separated. The wages of sin is death. And then in... I. And then he puts in parentheses, spiritual separation from God, Romans 6.23. This diagram illustrates that God is holy and man is sinful. A great gulf separates the two. The arrows illustrate that man is continually trying to reach God and the abundant life through his own efforts, such as a good life, philosophy, or religion, but he inevitably fails. The third law explains the only way to bridge this gulf. Well, isn't that funny? He mentions that philosophy and religion fails, but he gives you this gulf, which is philosophy. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> anyway, Law 3 says, I, I didn't mean to laugh, but hopefully you didn't trust in this tract. Hopefully you trust in the gospel that saves you, because this tract will not save you. Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. Through him you can know and experience God's love and plan for your life. He died in our place. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8 He rose from the dead. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6. He doesn't list 1 through 1 and 2, which tells you it's the gospel that saves you. Okay? He just puts down there that, it's, that Christ died for our sin, was buried, and rose again. That is the gospel, but he doesn't tell you it's the gospel. So how do you know it's the gospel? If you pick this track up off the ground. He is the only way to God. Now he puts you back in prophecy. He goes to John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He puts you back under the law. Remember, Old Testament books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are law books under the covenant. What is he doing? He's putting you back on the, under the law. What does God say about law and grace? You can't mix the two. This track mixes both. What does that do? It voids out the cross. Then he gives you a diagram. This diagram illustrates that God has bridged the gulf that separates us from him by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross in our place to pay the penalty for our sins. It's not enough just to know these three laws. And not only that, he's putting you under spiritual law. Think about that. It's called the four spiritual laws. We're not under law, we're under grace. Anyway, law number four. We must individually receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That's a work, receive. Then we can know and experience God's love and plan for our lives. And then he says we must receive Christ. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, say we receive Christ. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. John 1.12, again, Old Testament doctrine, okay, as many as received him, okay, that's a works. 
They're under the Old Testament. They're under the law. Okay? We receive Christ through faith. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is funny. He says we receive Christ through faith, but this verse doesn't say anything about receiving. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Nothing about receiving Christ there. When we receive Christ, we experience a new birth. That is wrong, okay? Old Testament doctrine is for Israel. Israel is the firstborn of God, Exodus 4.22. And Israel gets the new birth when they receive the New Testament, when they receive the Holy Spirit, they get the new birth. They got the new birth at Pentecost. That is not the church, the body of Christ. That is the church of Israel getting the Holy Spirit at Pentecost because God was preparing them to go through the tribulation. But the tribulation was interrupted in Acts chapter 8. Christ was standing next to the Father because he was going to issue the great day of the Lord. It was going to happen. But what happened? He saved the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9. And now Christ is sitting again. Thank God. Because then we had a chance to get saved. We receive Christ through personal invitation. Here we go. More works. Personal invitation. Christ speaking. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. Revelation 3.20. Revelation has nothing to do with church, the body of Christ. Remember Galatians chapter 2, verses 7, 8, and 9. It is for Israel. James, James's books, Peter's books, and John's books are all written to the circumcision, not the church, the body of Christ. And then he says, receiving Christ involves turning to God from self and trusting Christ to come into our lives to forgive our sin and to make us what he wants to be. That's works. That is not faith in the death, burial, and resurrection. That is a false gospel that will send you to hell. If you see this track on the street, throw it out. All right, it's just going to confuse somebody and it's going to send somebody to hell is what this track's going to do. Just to agree intellectually that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for our sins is not enough, nor is it enough to have an emotional experience. We receive Jesus Christ by faith as an act of the will. This is a false gospel, you guys. None of this is in the Bible. That you have to turn to God from self, that you have to agree intellectually that you have to receive Christ by faith. It, it's wrong. What's the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's it. This is four pages of, of mixing law and grace, four pages of the gospel mixed with works, and it just, it's just horrible, you guys. The two circles represent two kinds of lives. He has a circle that says self-directed life, and then he has a circle that says Christ-directed life. And then he says, self is on the throne, Christ is outside the life, interests are, di are directed by self. And this is all philosophy of man right here. And then it says, Christ directed life. Christ is in the life and on the throne. Self is yielding to Christ. Interests are directed by Christ, resulting in harmony with God's plan. Well, if you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, you're sealed until the day of redemption. Okay, You're complete in Christ. You're at peace with God, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. All right, no one's ever going to separate you from the love of Christ, Romans chapter 8. It has nothing to do with yourself. It has nothing to do with your will. It has nothing to do with turning from self, turning from your sin, repenting, being baptized, water baptized, tithing. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what Christ did for you. It's done. You don't have to do anything. It's done, okay? That's the gospel of the grace of God, right? Without works, no boasting, not of yourselves. All of this is about yourself when they tell you it's not. If they tell you to turn from your sin, it's about yourself. If they tell you to take a personal inv invitation, it's about yourself. Personal? Which circle best represents your life? Which circle would you like to have represent your life? All right, I'm not going to go on any further with this track. I think you get the point. They mix law and grace. They mix prophecy with the mystery. And they ultimately void out the cross of Christ. Okay? They mix law and grace, works and faith. 
thus missing the simplicity of the gospel. Okay, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Many have the idea that Christianity is joining a church or giving money, but none of those things are involved in the gospel of salvation. This station is dedicated to the gospel of the grace of God. You hear it every time you tune in. Okay? It's not six pages long like, like the four spiritual law track. It's four verses. That's what saves your dying soul today. Okay? It should be obvious that a man can do things to earn his trip to heaven then Jesus Christ wasted time on Calvary's cross, Galatians 2.21. In fact, his death was for our sins, his burial was payment for the wages of sin, and his resurrection demonstrated victory from death and hell. Those items are the elements of the gospel. Faith in what Jesus did then is what saves. It could not be simpler, but maybe that is the problem. Mankind tends to reject simple solutions, especially when such solutions declares man's best efforts worthless in the face of what God did in Christ has already accomplished. All right, you're complete. You don't have to do anymore. It's done. Jesus Christ died for your sin, was buried, and rose again. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, 2 Corinthians 1:12 and 2 Corinthians 11.3. He's done it all for us. We have nothing left to do but to be a faithful ambassador of reconciliation, sharing the gospel to others so that they can get saved, so that we can teach faithful men to teach faithful men. Thanks again for joining me here at Preaching the Gospel That Saves. I know it was a lot of material tonight. I challenge you to start looking at some of the tracks that you have, if, you, if you've been given tracks, and compare them to Pauline truth, Pauline doctrine, and you will find that you will not see the gospel that saves you today, the gospel of the grace of God. Thanks again for listening.